welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Zoom and Two Adventure series. Um, today we have Mike and Mike. They're back from Mike and Mike's underwater um, photography school, and they're going to be talking to us today about how to get the most out of your photo software. So um, last time we did a call with Mike and I, Mike, we were very busy. We had a ton of uh, questions asked, and I think the call actually went an hour over an hour, which um, uh, we, we may go today. If you guys have questions, we'll try to get them answered. And um, if you have any questions to be asked, you're going to have to send them to me through the chat box. So you can find the chat box on the below. Um, when you hover over the screen, you click the chat box, and that, that box comes straight to me. I will ask appropriate questions for the presenters. And uh, yeah, so if you're unfamiliar with Mike and Mike, uh, the little bio we have on them here on our website says that the two Mikes own the Mike and Mike Photography School. With 25 years of experience, their greatest satisfaction is assuring the students receive their, fir their finest instruction. For 30 years, Aggressor Liverboards has been the exclusive home of the exceptional school where photographers learn new skills and beautiful destinations worldwide. Mike Haver serves on the board of directors of the Sea of Change Foundation. Mike Miskleski is a recipient of the prestigious SSI Platinum Pro certification. So how are you guys doing today? Doing great. We're doing great. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for having us back. Boy, they never learn, do they? <laughs> back by popular demand. Yeah. All right, guys, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you, and um, we'll ask you some questions here as we go. Does that sound good? Sounds perfect. Yeah. Righty. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us back again. Thanks for stopping by to see in our presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about software for your digital photography. Um, and please keep in mind that we, we're not here to teach you how to use a specific software. We want to give you kind of like the 30,000 foot view. We want to tell you what to expect from the software. We'll give you some suggestions as to what you might want to try yourself and show you some of the more common um, adjustments, if you want to call it that, or the most more common uses that this software um, will provide you, okay? Um, I guess um, we need to look at, the, at what the software is supposed to do. And basically, it's supposed to do three main things. The first is to help you organize all of those digital files. You know, way back when, when we shot film, boy, I'm tired of saying that, but way back when, when we shot film, you used to put the slides in a little slide holder and you'd organize the pages and you'd put them in a binder and you knew where the slides were. You knew how to find them again. With these digital files, we're talking about something that's kind of ethereal. And it's in the computer someplace, but I don't know where. And, and so you need to be able to organize and find that stuff again, okay? The other thing that, um, the second thing that you want to be able to do is to be able to process your pictures. And notice we say process. We don't say correct or adjust or anything like that because basically you should be shooting it right the first time. And, you know, as we all know, we can't be perfect. As a matter of fact, in a, in a situation where it's a question of either getting the shot and maybe not having the exposure quite right because the action's happening too fast, I'll take the shot, okay? But uh, when you have the time, you should be working on trying to get your pictures proper the first time. However, because we're underwater, we got that little extra special knife in the back of the water, okay? Trying to not only kill us, but kill our pictures. So there's some basic adjustments that you might want to use no matter whether you get it right or wrong, okay? And then finally, the thing is to be able to share the picture, okay? You're, you're shooting your images, but you don't have to give the original to someone else anymore if you want them to see the picture. You can, you can actually export a copy of that picture, okay? Which is just as good as the original. So um, that's our little um, opening statement here. Um, Mike wants to talk a little bit about uh, how you set your computer up for your monitor and maybe your structure and whatnot. Yeah, the, before we get to that, what we want to talk about is, is very briefly, if, uh, let's go back to the camera for a second. Um, ideally, uh, especially with underwater photography, um, there's, there's a physical difference, obviously, between shooting topside and, and shooting underwater. Uh, there are variations that take place as light travels through the water column into your camera 
that make it preferable for you be, to be able to do some processing. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna talk about first is in an ideal situation, we want to be able to shoot our camera in raw mode so that that gives us the most capability of being able to make an adjustment to our photos when we get them to the computer. That's number one. Uh, number two is we've got to organize our images in such a way that we're able to find them. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is when we capture images on a card, we want those images to be transferred from the card to the computer and we make our card as nothing more than a transportation device from the camera to the, to the computer. Some cameras have the ability to download without removing a card. Um, other cameras, you've got to remove the card, you've got to put the card into some sort of a card reader and transfer the files. What we recommend is that we take those files and download them from the card without doing any kind of processing to the image before it goes to the hard drive of your computer. In order to illustrate that, we're gonna open up a new window that doesn't include our pretty faces, Aww. and we're gonna to start to show you the way that we do it. So basically what you're looking at here is uh, a hard drive, my hard drive, uh, or a picture of my hard drive with the file structure. And what we do is in order to make sure the pictures go where we want, like Mike said, we'll copy them off of the card and put that into our hard drive in the exact place that we want. Sometimes when you use software to trans transfer it or use the, the, the whatever program you're using to transfer it, sometimes you forget to look at something and you hit a button and it transfers it and you don't know where it went. Okay, this way we can, we can put it where we want it and we know where it is and then add it to the software later. So what you see here is the hard drive. It's called Aperture Masters in that particular case. That it says Aperture Masters because in this particular case, Mike is still working through an older software program that, that Apple made called Aperture. What we're gonna be discussing once we get past this part here is we're gonna be discussing the most common uh, softwares available today, uh, leading out by Adobe's Lightroom. So the next step is, or the next phase is the filing cabinet, okay? Now we all have different ways of filing. Some people like to file uh, by the name, chronologically, geographically, it doesn't matter. It's, it's up to you. You can do this whatever makes sense for you. But in this particular case, the way I have it set up, okay, I've got folders that have a, a very broad category of images, like the aggressor class shots, all of the pictures that I've taken on the boat of people for all the aggressor classes we've done, okay? Or Palau topside, or in this case, underwater Cayman, okay? So that underwater Cayman are all the pictures that I've kept that I've taken underwater in Grand Cayman, and then the next structure over is a list of all of those trips. And it's filed uh, chronologically. And the way that that date system works is it's 200308. So in that particular case, it's, uh, 20,003, and the 08 is the month August. So this was August of 20,003. And by doing it that way with the year first and the month second, you'll have that fall into a regular chronological system. Uh, if you do it the way we normally do it, like uh, uh, August of, of 2003, it would be 08, 2003, then all the Augusts would be together, okay? Not really chronological. Again, this is just the way I do it. It's not necessarily how you have to do it. It's just some sort of a starting point, okay? All right. Um, so uh, the other thing to mention is once you have a hard drive full of images, you really need to have some uh, method of backing it up, either an, an, another hard drive or what they call a RAID, where it actually makes a copy of your, your image um, at the same time that you put it on there because these files 
if you lose that drive, everything on that drive is gone. So if you don't have copies of that drive, um, you could wind up losing all the, the uh, files that you shot. Hard drives are gonna die. There's, there's no question about that. So having multiple backups of your, of your images protects you. You know, if you have a primary hard drive, a standalone hard drive with all of your images, and one day you start to boot it up and you st start to see some anomalies or it has essentially died right from the outset, you now have your secondary backup as your, as your life insurance. So you can immediately go online or run out to Best Buys, pick up another hard drive and back up that hard drive so that you're, you're never at, at the potential loss of all of your images. As far as Mike and I are concerned, we have our images on at least three hard drives so that if the primary working hard drive should die, uh, we still have two which means that we have a little bit more luxury to go out and buy another hard drive and back up the, the, that hard drive and get us back to, to three hard drives again. Hard drives are, are reasonably inexpensive these days to have uh, many terabytes of storage available. So it, it's just a matter of time being involved. A lot of times when we're traveling, we're traveling with a laptop laptop hard drives are relatively small to begin with. And so what we can do while we're traveling is travel with a, a bigger hard drive so that we can transport or copy our images over to that while we're traveling. And then when we get home uh, and we're sure that everything is backed up properly, we can dump the images from our, from our uh, travel uh, hard drive, which is um, the, the, laptop hard drive and and save our space on the laptop for future trips one other point um uh if you can locate one of those hard drives off-site meaning not in your house um that will really be a, a true backup because um um if anything happened to your house god forbid and all three hard drives were there you have an issue that's why some people will like to store things in the cloud as well, okay? Okay, so. Um, hey guys, so do we have to have a, uh, are we supposed to be seeing a big white blank screen right here? Or do you guys have a photo that's there? Because on our end, we're seeing white screens. What does that look like? Uh, I see your, uh, the road photo on the left upper corner, small. But you don't see what anything, in the middle? You don't see anything in the in the middle? Uh, middle screen is blank white. All right. Let me let's try something here. Hang on a second. Let me stop sharing. Let me go to share again. Share. Anything? Same. In the middle? Um. Why is it doing that? It's... Do you see? Uh... It's, it, okay, well, um, we can keep talking until we get this figured out. Um, yeah, let me let me go blank and uh, or go mute, and I'll try to figure something out real quick with our IT guy. Okay. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Um, we're going to get to the to the screens on, on Lightroom for a second, but let's let's just um, uh, tell you a little bit more about about the uh, the files themselves. Okay, not so much in, in terms of storing, but but one of the things that, that, that's a benefit is that these programs will allow you to make adjustments to the picture, whether it's a color adjustment or a cropping or whatever, without destroying the original. It's called non-destructive editing, which means whether you're shooting in a raw file or whether you're shooting in just straight JPEG, as some cameras uh, will only give you the option for, um, these programs will make the adjustments without having to, to um, uh, attack or damage the, the original. Okay, it's called non-destructive editing. And um, the, you could look at it in terms of, Mike, Mike calls it, uh, you got a great way of describing it as a recipe, okay? Um, we create recipes for the original. So you could have an original picture of a clownfish, let's say, and have four, five, six different versions of that clownfish, where the original picture 
is going to remain the same, but one of them might be a black and white. One of them might have a little bit change of exposure. One of them might be cropped a little differently. And, and you haven't created three different pictures. You've basically created three different recipes. Basically, what's happening is your software program is opening up a representation of your original file. Okay, so what you see on your screen and what you're trying to adjust is not the original file itself. It's simply, like I said, a representation. So as you make adjustments to make that representation look more like you want it to look, what the, what the software is doing is it's keeping track of those adjustments that you make. And so essentially, it is just a little tiny file, a text file, that tells the program when you want to export this file and make it look like that particular picture, you need to do this, 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 and this. And so the programs themselves, and there, and there are a bunch of them out there right now that do remarkably good jobs. Okay, there's, obviously there's Lightroom. Okay, there is one that's called Capture One. There's another one that's called On One. And all of these do a great job. Now we've been we've been keeping uh, copies of those of those programs, Mike and I, for years now, because we we need them to do the things that are most important for underwater photographers. And we've never been prepared to say, okay, we can move from Lightroom. Lightroom does a remarkably good job in all the things that we need underwater photographers to do. But basically, when it comes down to one of the final things that we do as underwater photographers, Lightroom does it reasonably well, and the other ones didn't do it well at all. So we, we always kind of negated those other, uh, those other softwares. Now, the common, the common corrections that we would do, we would do white balance, we would do an exposure correction, we would do a crop, we would adjust the tonal range. What do I mean by the tonal range? Sometimes our shadow area needs to be opened up a little bit. Sometimes just our highlights need to be dropped down a little bit, where we can take um, an area that's a part of contrast and, and not utilize contrast. Because when we use contrast, we're moving both ends of the, of the spectrum at the same time. We might only want to take care of our blacks and our dark shadow areas, or we might want to take care of our whites or our highlight areas. So adjusting uh, tonal range is, is important. Sharpening, the ability to change a, a, a color subject into a black and white, and then the single most important one for underwater photographers, in my point of view, is being able to do spotting or being able to do what we call healing or cloning, okay? And, and Lightroom was very, very good at doing it, except it is, in, in our opinion, a little bit clunky. Well, suddenly one of the other programs that tends to be a, a, a little bit more expensive program, Capture One, has just introduced their capability of doing both um, healing and cloning as well. And it looks very, very promising. So we're not in a position to say, those of you who haven't gone to, app, uh, to Lightroom, jump onto Capture One, we are in a position to say, now there's competition to, to Lightroom. And it looks very, very promising. So those are the main things that, that we need to do with any one of these softwares. All of the things except that, that healing and cloning are, are well done by any software. And in fact, what happens now is in, in Lightroom, if somebody's got a lot of spots, uh, backscatter especially, to get rid of, what they tend to do is they export into Photoshop. They use, utilize Photoshop to do the, uh, the adjustments, the, the spotting, and then bring it back into Lightroom. The thing that I don't like about that is you have to export it as something. 
So the likelihood is you're exporting it as a TIFF or you're exporting it as a PSD. Then you make your, your spots and your clones and you bring it back. And, and it is in that final form, a TIFF or a PSD, uh, which doesn't allow you to go back and make your color correction. So it, it, it holds that, that healing and cloning to the last possible thing. Hang on, Mike's doing something, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it uh, in the background, so go ahead. Okay, so so essentially what we're gonna wanna do at this point, and, and hopefully be able to see the screen, is go through some of those individual corrections. Correct. Have we, um, um, are we still with you guys? Yes. Let's try uh, sharing your screen instead of sharing the application and see if that works. Sharing my screen instead of the application. Yes, I think, so when it pops up the different options of Windows, um, I'm guessing that you might have clicked on Lightroom application. Correct, it's, and I have no other option. Okay, that's what I was afraid of. Um, And so right now you don't see a picture of a road. Just only up there in the left corner is a thumbnail, not mm -hmm. on the big screen. The and, and in the middle of the screen, what do you see? White. Big white blank. A big white blank. How about now? Unfortunately, the same thing. I wonder if there's some kind of uh, problem that Lightroom doesn't do that when you do share screens, which we, I didn't think about it at all. Um, is there any audible we could pull right now, guys, here on the spot and see if there's like some photos you guys could show and show us a little bit of like what you did to the photos? Well, let's, uh, let's try something here. Hang on a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. I do have one more idea that just came from Rich, if you want to try it, Mike. Okay. Uh, open the Zoom application, click settings, the gear icon. One more thing. Uh, what do you see now? Uh, I see a photo library. Okay, so we're into aperture right now. Yep. I mean, we could do click this. On, click on one picture to fill the screen. Do you see a single picture? Yes. Okay. And then... Um, on the left-hand side, do you see a bar, a, a, a column with, uh, let's say, adjustments with it? Yes, all your files there and the adjustments and info. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, this is this is actually not a bad thing because basically this goes back to what we said originally. Okay. It doesn't matter what the program is. The the adjustments are still basically the same. One program may call it something different than the other, but, uh, but without a doubt, um, it's gonna be the same thing. Can you import that library, that, that folder? I have the same pictures here. Okay. I have the same pictures. Oh, okay, here. then we're good. Okay, so um, unfortunately, these pictures are already processed, but you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna unprocess them, okay? Go to adjustments. Yeah, I, I will. I just wanted to, to bring it to the master. What you see here is is what I shot. Okay, there was we were at Tiger Beach. Uh, one of the one of the divers was um, uh, an eye doctor, and he was very interested in getting close to shark eyes, and uh, was kind of wondering if we would allow that to happen. And we we're saying, "What are you kidding me?" Of course. Um, so once he got the eyes, then he started seeing, well, I can shoot the mouth and the teeth and all that. I thought that was a pretty cool shot of him with the sharks, but I was a little bit too far away. Okay. Um, and so what, uh, instead of, instead of going to master, unclick the, um, okay. Yeah, that works. That'll work. Enhance. And then when you click them back, yeah, you'll get it. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Go so ahead. anyhow, um, anyhow, basically, uh, what, what we did, what I did to fix this particular picture 
was a couple of very simple um, settings, okay? The first was, was the white balance, okay? That, that's a, um, uh, a primary correction that um, you may find using quite a bit. Now, white balance can be kind of a, a misleading term, okay? Um, what you're looking for is a neutral color. It could, be, it could be white, but there should be some detail in that white. It could be gray, or it could be black, again, with some detail. And some of the best white balance uh, uh, gray that you have right here is right here on the shark, okay? So what I did was I brought the white balance uh, pointer over onto the shark, and I clicked onto the shark's um, skin, and sure enough, that brought the color back. But it still wasn't quite there, okay? It still wasn't the color that, uh, that I wanted. And it wasn't so much a color thing, but it was more of a, of a contrasty thing, okay? So the next thing that I looked at was, well, let me try the exposure. Let me bring the exposure down. But unfortunately, by bringing the exposure down, everything started to come down. Even the whites were, were coming down, okay? And that wasn't, uh, that wasn't what I wanted either. So instead of working with the picture, the entire picture for the exposure, I worked on just the dark areas, just the blacks, just the shadows. And by bringing the shadows out, that's where we had um, um, the picture that you see in front of you, okay? That brought the contrast up, that, that left the whites alone, because what you can do with these, uh, with these tools is you're able to work on certain tonal ranges um, on an image so that you can, um, uh, bring out the blacks, make the blacks darker without darkening the light colors. Okay, that's, that's the advantage that you have on, on being able to have all of these tools fine-tuned like that. Okay. If you, if you bring in that folder that was in uh, Lightroom, yeah, those are uncorrected, right? Um, yeah. So bring them in. I could do that. Bring them in and then we make uh, corrections on the fly. All right, let me just, um, something's happening here. Anybody got questions so far? Yeah. Would you like us to dance? Actually, that was the first question. Can you guys dance? That was uh... a... <laughs> well, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> Yeah, we got a couple questions. Let's hit them. Let's see. Oh, shoot. All right. Uh, is there a recommendation of a minimum laptop computer configuration that you get the most out of Lightroom? It's pretty slow on my PC, but I also have about 20,000 images. <laughs> you have to, if there's 20,000 images on the PC, it's long past time to get those images off of the PC and onto a standalone hard drive. And and that would be the that would be the first thing that I would recommend. Okay. Also, um, uh, I don't know if we mentioned it um, earlier, but um, the age of of your of your laptop might be a consideration as well, because uh, things are a little bit peppier now. They're the graphics displays on. Um, um, on the computers are a little bit better, so it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough call. You know, it, it depends on what your computer is, and maybe reach out to your your dive buddies, see what type of, of computer they're using. I know for a fact um, that uh, you can't go wrong with a Mac. Sorry, <laughs> that's the way I am. And there's some probably some PC people out there that probably want to kill me for that, but. Um, uh, basically, that's um, that's kind of the way we we look at it. Okay. Would you recommend using an iPad Pro for traveling? I believe that there is a Lightroom version for iPads. Um, here's the problem with uh, the tablets, iPads, or whatever uh, storage um, and screen screen size. Now, the iPad Pro has got a, a good size screen. Okay, but um, but the the uh, iPad 
itself, the uh, screen might, might not be big enough um, for you to actually sit down and not so much do all of your adjustments and corrections while you're on the trip, but to be able to see the pictures good enough to make sure that there's nothing going wrong with your equipment um, to deal with uh, while you're on the trip, okay? Um, the biggest uh, problem that we've had with, uh, with something like an iPad though is, especially if you're shooting raw, if you're shooting a lot of raw files, you need some sort of an external storage device. Um, wouldn't you say that? Yeah. Yeah. But now, you know, I, I noticed that now they're coming out with a terabyte size um, storage for some of the iPads. So, but then again, once again, you're gonna you're gonna utilize it on the boat with the anticipation that when you get home, you're gonna offload those images onto a hard drive. Uh, so, if you've got a terabyte of storage on your iPad Pro, then sure, why not? Okay. Uh, I went back up here with the screen. Can you see the? Can you see the the picture? Yeah. Okay. We're good to go now. Okay. We're back. We're back in business. So uh, one more quick thing before we get into another adjustment or showing the adjustments, and and that is um, after your pictures are in the program that you're using, again whether it's Lightroom or Capture One or or um, Aperture or whatever you're using. The very first thing you should be doing is rating those pictures. And by rating, I mean going through those images, being very uh, forgiving, okay? Looking at the picture and putting a one star next to the pictures that you wanna come back to and look at. And the reason why we say to do that is because um, if you spend a lot of time working on a picture and specifically also spotting that picture to get to get the uh the the, the black backscatter let's say out of the picture and then five pictures down the line you have a much better one that was clean you just wasted all that time on that other picture so by going through them first and looking at them and being very forgiving like i said and giving one stars next to the ones you really want to look at then you can take the ones that you didn't star and move them off, throw them away, whatever you want to do with them, and then focus on the one stars. And then go back and look at the ones that you want to work on. Maybe give them a three star. But by doing that, you kind of maximize the ones that you want to deal with. So since we had a little bump in the road and we're back on track right now, let's, let's uh, encapsulate what, what we're talking about. First thing that happens is you come out of the water, You've got images on your camera. You take your card out. You go over to your compu computer. You download the images onto your computer into a specific spot, into a specific location that you can go back to and find when, when you want to, okay? That's, that's number one. Number two, you then pull the card out of your computer and put it away safely, okay? Put it back into the camera. You know that you've got everything backed up at that point, but don't start to work on the program until you're certain that the that your card is out of the computer. Because sometimes you may inadvertently begin to do processing on an image, and you're not doing processing on the image that resides on the computer. You're doing processing on the image that resides on your card. That's bad for two reasons. Number one, the card is not designed for that purpose. And you can go and, and corrupt the card by changing files while they're on the card. The other thing is you've done, a work, you've done work on a bunch of images. You, you take that card out and your program no longer remembers where those images are. You think you put them on the hard drive, but you never did any of the processing on the image on the hard drive. So number one, you download it. Number two, you remove the card, put it safely someplace else. Number three, you start to do what Mike just said. You open up into a Lightroom view, a light table view, and you start to give your, your ratings to images. If something's out of focus, then that becomes a rejected file. If you've got 10 shots of something that looks reasonably good, 
maybe one of them gets a, a two star instead of one star. Then you go back and that's the one you start to take a look at. All of these programs have the ability to, to view your images filtered by rating. So that when you go through 300 pictures that you shot in the course of a day, and you decided that, okay, out of that 300 pictures, I've got 30 pictures that are two stars. These are the ones that potentially I have to work on. That's great. So now you go through the two stars and you pick out the ones that you really, really want to start to work on sooner than, than the other ones. And you maybe give that a third star and then you start to process it. And maybe the process doesn't take place all at one time because the dive bell rang and you're going out for the next dive that afternoon. So in order to, to know that, oh, I started to process that, give it another star or give it a color at that point. And now you know that, that the red one is one that I already started to work on. And once you start to work on, a, on an image, follow it through, work on that image all the way through to completion. Okay, so now we're going to look at images one right. at another. I'm going to start off with uh, really quick on a, of a topside image, just because I want to make this um, uh, example, and then we'll flip it back uh, to the underwater stuff. As far as uh, JPEGs or RAW files, this is why we try and shoot RAW, okay? And I'm using a topside picture because we all kind of understand what those colors should look like. Underwater, things could be almost any color. So this is a JPEG shot with the wrong white balance setting, okay? maybe. You were shooting some indoor shots uh, at a party the night before. You had it set for tungsten, came outside, started shooting, and, and now you've got these cold, cold images. So uh, remember what we were talking about with the, with the white balance. Uh, the first correction would be white balance, okay? So I'm going to click on the white balance eyedropper tool, and I'm going to bring it to a spot that is, happens to be white with detail, that white stripe on the side of the road. And if you see, I can click on it, and once I did, all of a sudden, I got color back. Not a lot of color, though, because when you shoot JPEG, the camera captures a RAW file, processes it in the camera, and throws all the rest of the, the data away. So the JPEG has limited amount of, of uh, information. Let's go to that same picture with the same correction problem, the same white balance problem, okay? Only now, this is a RAW file. So I'm going to take that eyedropper, and I'm going to come back to the road. I'm going to do the exact same spot and click on it. What a huge difference. Okay, what a huge difference between those two pictures. If you want to look at them side by side, there you have it. Okay, the one on the left is the picture that was the raw file, and the one on the right was what we were able to grab from that JPEG. Not a lot of detail, not a lot of information there best you can. So if you can shoot raw, by all means shoot raw. If all you can shoot is JPEG, make sure you're shooting correctly. Okay, absolutely. Okay, um, one other uh, quick, hang on one second. One other quick um, um, image to take a quick look at uh, is this picture of Mike Haber. Um, not that we're going to do anything with it, I just want you to see a picture of Mike Haber. <laughs> Uh, when we used to shoot film, God, I hate saying that, um, we would just shoot um, slide film and we would say, if you're going to make a mistake on the exposure, underexpose it a little bit. Not so much with, uh, with digital, because if you're going to make a mistake with a digital file, better to slightly overexpose than underexpose. When you open up an underexposed pictures, when you try and make it a little bit brighter, a lot of those shadows, you can wind up getting what's called um, noise, digital noise in the picture. Not the, the same thing doesn't happen the other way around when you try and darken an overexposed picture, which this is, okay? So let's take a look at the, um, at the um, um, top of the picture. You can see the top of the driveway. There's, it's all blown out and very, very little bit of detail or anything like that, okay? Uh, did I really shoot that? Jeez, my God, how could I have been so wrong? Look what happens when I try and make that picture a little bit darker. Look at the top of that road. Look at detail that starts coming out that you never even saw in there. 
that's that raw information. That's the file capturing more data than what you, it's showing you so that you're able to manipulate it back and forth when you need to um, if you start to um, uh, adjust your pictures, okay? So let's go back to that uh, shot with the diver and the shark because this, I think this really makes for a really good uh, uh, demonstration, okay? Blah, 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 yeah, I shot the picture, blah, 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 he's an eye doctor. Okay, if I go to that eyedropper tool again where I'm gonna use the white balance tool and I go right back to the side of the shark, boom, color. Color because the information is there already, okay? Just not being utilized until I change the white balance. So again, if I, if I try and, and darken up the, the, um, the blacks a little bit by the exposure, it's happening on the entire picture. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to make the sand dark because it's not supposed to be dark, okay? But if we take our black point and we move our black point to get the blacks a little bit richer, or uh, you can see in the, uh, in the histogram where if we make our blacks blacker and our whites wider, we can pop the contrast of that picture and really make it uh, looking at something that's a lot better than that, okay? Now, we do prefer to utilize separate controls of our highlights and our shadows than utilize contrast. Because I said earlier, contrast is going to move both ends of the, of the histogram simultaneously the same amount. So when we, when we take care of our highlights, our shadows, our black points, our brightness separately, we're able to control them to a, to a much finer degree. Maybe the highlights didn't have to move as much. Maybe the blacks had to move a lot more than if we had done it with contrast. So we, we tend to avoid the contrast tool and, and work with our, our black points, our highlights. Now, we had to because of, because of the way this presentation was going, we had to jump back to our old pal Aperture as the program. But these controls, they exist exactly the same way on Lightroom, they, they uh, exist the same way on Capture One. Now, under one or two circumstances, the names may be slightly different, but, but by and large, they're, they're all the same. Any adjustments are all the same. So um, when we do this um, on the boats in our, in our classes, um, we um, do a general presentation, but most of what we do here is a one-on-one -on -one with you guys. Okay, because people have different programs. Sometimes we're familiar with it, sometimes not. But um, to get to get down into the meat of the matter, uh, we like to do that in, in smaller groups, either one on one or with two or three people, um, uh, to help better the understanding. Okay, another shot: uh, shark in a tiger beach, shot with a sixty millimeter lens. <laughs> I was uh, trying to do some macro and this uh, lemon shark was swimming around and it would just look cool. And I figured, what the hell, it's only digital, right? Um, and I took the picture and that's what I got, okay? Um, raw file, nonetheless. So let's see if we can work our magic. Um, the first thing I choose is white balance. And, and by the way, there's no specific order to doing this. Um, in other words, if you do white balance first and then exposure or vice versa, you're not going to change the way the final picture looks. However, it may change the way you perceive the picture, so you might do different adjustments based on, on how you're seeing it. So um, let's just see where we go from here. And in this particular case, the white balance, oh yeah, I see a little bit more color in it, but still looks like a crappy picture, okay? Um, all right. so really, really want to deal with this though. So let's go back to what Mike was talking about in terms of, of, our, of our whites and blacks and, and things like that, okay? I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna, there are no, if you look at the histogram and the histogram's on the left-hand side of your screen right now, and it's in the, kind of like in the middle, there's two. There's one at the top that's showing you the red, greens, and blue uh, pixels, 
and the one in the middle that's shown you just the uh, exposure, just the um, uh, general. You don't see any of the edges reaching out towards the ends of the histogram. They're all kind of bunched up in that one uh, slightly off center to the left. So that means that there's no real black pixels, there's no real white pixels. I'm gonna try and make some extra pixels by dragging those two sliders a little bit so that we can get some black and get some whites, okay? And take a 60 millimeter macro shot of a shark and go from that to that. Now, you could spend a little more time on this, maybe punch up the color in the grass uh, or whatever. Uh, again, the, the, we don't wanna zero too much in on one picture, uh, but I do wanted to show you that, that there's a lot of information in the raw file, okay? Oh, by the way, we got this big old ginder up here, um, probably a uh, dust spot on the sensor. Could you imagine that I let, let me do that? We can get rid of that. We can get rid of that one of two ways. We can either clone it out or heal it out, okay? So if, if we, um, the difference between those two um, processes is clone will take an actual copy of a, a origin point and put it over the spot point. So I'm take gonna clone it. Yeah, I'm gonna clone it right here, all right? And I'm gonna say that I want this to be my origin point and fix this. Bingo, I got a shark eye floating in the middle of uh, the water, okay? Not quite the right uh, choice there. So let's get rid of that and let's go back to something else. Let's say maybe if I go right next to it and pick that as my origin point and come over the black. Not bad, better, okay? I can still see a little bit of a difference because I know where the spot was. You may, you know, someone else who hasn't seen this picture before might not. So in this particular case, I think uh, what I'll do is instead of using a clone, I'll use the repair tool. And with the repair tool, it said you can do the same thing like this is my origin point, but it doesn't make an exact copy of it. It says, okay, that's kind of like the thing you're looking for. But let me look at all the adjacent colors on the adjacent picture pixels and see if I can kind of blend it all together and make it look the same. In Lightroom, you would simply click on that spot and Lightroom would have selected a, um, a, a, a spot that it believes to be very similar. And at that point, you can actually move the, um, the primary selection point around until you're satisfied that it looks exactly the same. So, um, anybody, by, by the way, anybody have any questions yet? Yeah, we got some questions. Let's go ahead and take a uh, okay. few minutes to answer some of these. We've got six or seven here. Sure. Um, uh, hey, bro, I believe it was you and you were saying, mentioned earlier, uh, give it a color to, uh, so you know which one you're working on. Is that referring to the aperture down here, just making sure you're no, no, no. It doesn't matter in Lightroom or it doesn't matter in, in, uh, in Aperture. It doesn't matter in uh, Capture One. You're able to assign a label, a color label to individual pictures. Take a look at the picture in the middle with the doctor shooting the shark again. Okay, we're under the metadata, either in, here in Aperture or also in, in, in Lightroom and Capture One. We can actually put a, a color label. So if I wanted to make a blue, boom, there you go. You got a blue label or great a red there's a red label or yeah so so as i go through the process of of um, grading my images and working on my images and frankly if if i'm shooting sometimes the only time that i really have to to work on images is late at night after any everybody's gone to sleep okay um, or after a meal i've got a, a half hour or so to, to, to work on some, some pictures. Again, the first thing that I do is I get rid of the pictures that I know I'm never gonna work on if I live to be 3,000 years old, 
okay? Then the ones that I like. And as I start to work my way up the star column, eventually when I get to five stars, in my way of doing it, five stars means it's finished. It's done. I'm not likely to work on that ever again, unless maybe I was going to do an alternate crop or something like that for, for a particular export purpose. But by and large, as far as normal uh, repairs are concerned, five star means it's, it's finished. Okay, up to that point, I might have a dozen pictures that have made it all the way up to four stars, which means they are right in the middle of processing. But then I might add different colors depending upon, like green means, boy, I want to finish this first. Red means um, I just started processing. You know, it, it depends on, on my particular mood. But I will use the colors as a way to have um, an intermediate distinction between, let's say, a three star and a four star, or a four star and a five star. Now, not to be, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to make this sound snotty or something like this, but I rarely use the colors, okay, myself. But that just goes to show you how you can tailor all of this stuff to how you like to do it. Not right. necessarily follow someone else's pr procedure. Got any more questions? Yes. Uh, when I download from the card, it transfers as a JPEG file. Is there a raw file somewhere there? Well, uh, that's a tough question to answer without asking a couple of questions. And the first is, are you in fact shooting raw? If you are shooting raw, okay, um, then the question to answer, ask is, are you shooting raw plus JPEG? And if you are shooting raw plus JPEG, then you might be importing both files, but there's a setting on the program that's saying, pay attention to the JPEGs, not the raws. Um, your, your, import, your import preference in Lightroom, um, there's a whole dialogue that, that when you set up that import preference, um, it gives you the option to only pay attention to the JPEGs, only import the JPEGs, or only import the raw, or import both of, or both of them. Um, it also gives you uh, the option of where you want those files to remain. And those are all things you need to pay attention to. So I suspect based on that question that the solution lies in that import dialog box. If whoever asked that question wants to take it a little bit further, uh, or for that matter, if any of you guys have questions that we don't get to, feel free to drop, drop me an email, okay? Um, uh, do it to info at jimchurchphoto.com. That's info at jimchurchphoto.com. Or I don't know if there's any way to forward from aggressor, but- Or not, one not, of our Facebooks. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Uh, go, go to our Facebook. Go to and, our Facebook. Mike, yeah. Mike and Mike, uh, Mike and Mike yeah, Photo. Yeah, you do a search on Mike and Mike, Mike and Facebook. Mike, Mike and Mike Photo. Yeah, and, and we're right there. Uh, you got, you said info at jimchurchphoto.com? Correct. All right. That's just been sent here to the group. Let's go to the next question here. Um, what are you, what are you guys feelings on uh, dive plus app for cell phones for smartphones? I, um... <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if what you're looking to do is, take pictures that are essentially snapshots and just show your friends, okay, this was where I was, this is what I saw, that's fine. If you're looking for a picture that ultimately you Walmart. might, yeah, you might, you might want to frame, um, you might want to turn into your next Christmas card, mm, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, the ideal way to go. Not because the camera doesn't work that well, okay? They all work great for what they're designed for, topside. Underwater, we got all kinds of lectures about how the water is just out there trying to destroy your picture. And in order to get something really, really good, you need to understand how that water works. Okay. Is Lightroom also viable for processing GoPro videos? I don't believe so, no. Okay. No. Um, I would stick with the GoPro uh, program for that. 
Okay. Uh, when my pictures are in the software, does that mean there's a second copy of the image file in the software? Taking twice it, as much space. That on? depends. That depends upon that import preference that you set up. JPEG raw type of thing. If you're shooting both. And 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 where you're, and and where you're asking the program to deposit your images. For instance, if you do if you do an import after you've downloaded the images into, let's say, your pictures folder on your laptop, okay? It's no longer in the card. You're not using the, the program to move your images into their final destination. You've moved the images into the final destination. Now, you are importing the images into the program from the final destination. Your import preference should say, leave your images where they are. So in essence, your, your program's not importing the files into the program anymore. It's just kind of knowing where to reference those original files. So it's not making a second copy of, of your already downloaded and filed images. It's, it's just creating reference files that allows the program to access those images where you put them in the first place, which is how Mike and I utilize these programs. We want, we want the images to be in a very particular place on the computer. And, and then we do the import into the program, but it's just simply recognizing that the images exist where we put them in the first place. It's not moving them. Okay. Uh, let's take one more and then I'll let you guys get back. Uh, I just lost my chat box. There it is. Um, I have a problem you alluded to in your discussion of hard drives. My primary, primary external hard drive failed, but I had a backup. Unfortunately, Lightroom does not seem to be able to recognize the same photos on the backup version. Can you explain how to get Lightroom to find, recognize uh, the original so that I can edit and export? Alternatively, is there a way to export without having the original? Uh, no, you need the original. Um, okay, so basically what Lightroom has done is it's uh, forgotten where your pictures are. No, I'm sorry. It hasn't really forgotten. It, it, it doesn't know. It says, hey, wait a minute. Your pictures are at 123 South Street. And I go there at 123 South Street, and there's no house there. What it doesn't know is that 123 South Street is gone, and the pictures are actually living in a different location. So the first thing you would need to do would be to make sure that that hard drive, the new one, is, uh, has the exact same name as the old one, and that the folders are in the exact same order as the old one okay because that's what it's looking for and and if if it if it looks at it looks for one two three but it's if it, you had it made mistakenly space one two three then it doesn't know it's it's still gonna be looking for one two three if it's all the same okay um there might be some other uh behind the, the under the hood type of computer thing so in that case what you want to do is you want to go into your Lightroom program and the library on the left hand side where all of those folders are that have your images right click um, or in the case of a Mac uh, control click on the, um, the the top level and you should be getting a, a box I don't think we'll be able to see it this way um, we probably have to yeah, I don't think we can we can show them that. No, not to show them. I just opened it up so you could see. Oh, 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 oh I got you. I got you. <laughs> but uh, basically, you should be able to uh, to go to uh, to that um, that structure there, and it would be uh, relocate or find, um, and and it'll bring up like a browser window, in which case you would uh, you would then point to it, and it's kind of like changing the address. In Lightroom's um, in Lightroom's memory, 
okay, and you're telling Lightroom, uh, okay, don't go to 123 South Street anymore, go to 456 Main Street, and, and that's where the pictures will be. And if it's in the same, if it's in the same folder structure as the original drive, it should be able to figure it out. But if it doesn't, you might have to go to each individual folder um, to, to do that. In, um, in, in my particular case, I've got, like I said earlier, three hard drives that are identical to each other, except each has a different name. Okay, so my live uh, photo hard drive is actually called photo hard drive. Then the next one is photo hard drive two, and the next one is photo hard drive three. If this afternoon photo hard drive died, okay, I would go to photo hard drive two and erase the two. And, and make sure that it's named the exact same thing. And my program should be able to just follow through and find everything the way it is, because the file structure is exactly the same as it was on backup hard drive. Okay. Let's go back to, go back uh, to uh, playing uh, with to pictures. pictures. Okay. Playing with pictures with Mike and Mike. Let's take this uh, ribbon eel for a second. Um, okay. What's the first thing that we need? Well, we need to turn it, all right? So let's rotate it. So uh, it looks a little bit on the underexposed side. Um, so, and that exposure is something that I think is overall on this picture. So let's take the exposure down about a stop. Notice I'm not doing anything on the white balance because I think the white balance is okay and I won't really be able to tell until I get the exposure where I kind of want it. So. Right about there, I think, is, uh, is okay. And, and, and you know, uh, the other thing is, uh, we probably mentioned it before, but we're going to say it again, there's no right or wrong. It's what you like. It's the way you want to have this picture. And, and you know, if, if you like it more saturated versus not saturated from somebody else, then do it the way you want to do it. But there's no right and wrong way. It's the way you like it. Okay, uh, more stuff. Uh, so anyhow, um, the one thing that I see on this particular picture that I'm missing is blacks. I don't see that, that heavy duty black. And if I show the levels over here, we can look at that uh, histogram again on the, on the left-hand side towards the middle. And you can see that on the left-hand side of the histogram, it doesn't really reach out to that black uh, ridge which means that there's no pixels in this black range, okay? So if I take this, um, this slider and drag it towards the middle to where those pixels start, now I'm starting to make some of those not so black pixels black, okay? And you could do it the same way by changing the black point or uh, shadows or things like that. It's just different ways of controlling the same thing. So um, I also noticed in that histogram on the right-hand side that those pixels don't quite reach out towards the white side. And, you know, I do see that there's whites in the picture um, or things that are close to white. So I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And I'm going to move that until I think I'm in, ooh, that's not, that's not too bad right about there, okay? So color-wise, okay, we're good. One last thing I think this picture definitely needs is to be cropped. Okay, I don't like the way the, the ribbon eel is off to the side too much. So I'm gonna bring up the crop tool, okay? And here's another thing about cropping, um, uh, to, again, to show you that there's no one way to do things. I rarely, rarely crop outside of the original aspect ratio, in other words, However, that rectangle is formed, I'll keep that same ratio on the rectangle when I crop. Sometimes I'll freeform crop, sometimes I won't. Most of the time I won't. However, I probably am the direct opposite. I use a freeform crop um, way more than I use the original aspect ratio. I like the way that the image looks the way I like it to look. So I'm not constrained by uh, a particular uh, aspect ratio. I, I will crop it the way I like to see it cropped. And to, un to understand what we're talking about, I want you to watch here as I draw the crop, a crop, crop rectangle. No matter how I move this, this uh, cursor, 
it's going along the same diagonal. But if I go to uh, do not constrain, you can see how the cursor can, can change the, the box and it's not, it could be a square, it could be a rectangle, you know, it's like the outer limits. We will control the horizontal, we will control the vertical. So I'm gonna get rid of stuff that I don't need in this picture. And most of that stuff is on the left-hand side. Voila. There is no control more personal to each individual than the crop. I mean, how, how if you take 15 people, give them all the same picture and tell them to crop it, uh, the likelihood is that crop is gonna be different for everybody. So it's, it, there's, there's no real answer to cropping. It's what looks good to you. Hey, we've got some, uh, we have some schmutz okay. in the picture. Oh, I, I, it's two things on that, by the way, too, uh, in terms of adjustments and whatnot, we <clears> forgot <throat> to mention. When you make adjustments on your, on your screen, up the brightness all the way, okay? Don't try and look at it under a dark screen. Oh, and when he says up the brightness, we're not talking about the image. We're talking about the screen brightness. We're talking about if you've got a laptop and you've got a, a brightness control for your uh, device, make sure your screen is as bright as it can go. Too many times have both of us spent a lot of time making adjustments on a three quarter darkened uh, monitor only to realize that when we output it, um, the, the image was not the way we thought it was gonna be. So whenever we sit down with people on a boat and it's time for us to, to go through images, certainly the first thing I do is reach over to your laptop and, and push that brightness uh, button on your keyboard to make sure that the, the, the monitor itself is as bright as it can be. And that's really like a battery saving thing. You know, they, they, they try and conserve it by lowering the, the brightness, but hey, we need it to, to adjust our picture. So you know, we'll do it the way we want to do it. So Mike was kind enough to point out, thank you, Mike, that there were uh, particles in my picture. I don't understand how they got here. Um, so we're gonna spot them out too. But they're kind of small. And it's kind of like working a, a, a little thing with big thumb, big fingers. So I'll kind of, what I'll do is I'll zoom in when um, I have to work on stuff like that. And that way I'll be able to see a little bit easier and I'll be able to control it a little bit better. So bring up that uh, repair tool again, okay? And I'm gonna make the, uh, the circle just about a little bit bigger than the size of the spot I'm trying to get rid of. And if you notice, there's two circles there. There's an outside circle, and then there's an inner circle with a dotted line. And that's showing the amount of feathering. Anything inside of the dotted line is not gonna be feathered. Everything outside of the dotted line up to the solid circle is gonna be feathered, meaning it's gonna be kind of a mix of what's behind and not. That's, um... That's controlled by um, that's controlled in all the programs by something called softness. Correct. There you go. So okay. So um, let me make that a little bit smaller. Okay. I'm just getting the size right now. All right. So now because it's it's all not in any particular type of color area, I'm going to pick a, a area at random, and. I'm going to use that as my sampling point, and I'm going to click there, and pretty good. I'm not going to change my sampling point. It's going to stay, keep the same sampling point until I change it. So, I mean, oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Now, in Lightroom, pretty good. what you would be seeing at this point is you would be seeing exactly where Lightroom has made a decision to choose a sampling point. And most of the time, it's pretty good. Sometimes, not so good. When it's not so good, you can actually move the sampling point around to someplace that is just a little bit more um, useful for that particular thing. In Aperture, the program that Mike is using right now, um, you select the sampling point yourself. Now, one of the things that, that I've seen in this, this program that I talked about earlier in the, 
in our conversation, uh, Capture One, Capture One gives you both options. You can just go and, and allow the program to pick a sample uh, just like Lightroom does, um, or you can choose a sampling point yourself, which I really, really, really like. So in the future, you might be hearing more from Mike and I about this program, Capture One, um, than you do about Lightroom. Uh, the other thing about Capture One is it's also available as a subscription and you can purchase it outright and have it as a program that you own. And it's the first time that any other program has given us um, a good enough repair and cloning tool to think that it's potentially uh, acceptable to us underwater photographers. Um, Mike had mentioned that um, um, I still, and, and to a degree he does, still use Aperture, which is a program that was discontinued by Apple a number of years ago. And I'm bringing this point up only to show you about what um, upgrades are like. So um, for us as underwater photographers, if you were interested in, in having the latest version of the program, you'd go with the subscription uh, versus uh, I don't like the subscription idea. I'm going to buy it so that in case I suspend my subscription, I'll still be able to open up the library and get to my pictures. The biggest advantage subscribing and having the latest version of the program is going to give you is aside from whether or not you're happy with the, the cloning and, and whatnot, is if you upgrade your camera, you need the latest version of the program for it to understand the raw file. Um, a lot of times the, um, the, the camera manufacturers, well, all, all cameras have a different raw file, even in the same manufacturer. So uh, the camera model one, will have a different raw file than the camera model two from Nikon, let's say, okay? Uh, so you need both of those uh, translators, so to speak, for the programs to read it. You only get them when you upgrade the program. So if you've got a camera and you're not gonna upgrade your camera because you're happy with your camera and it's doing the best job, uh, there's no reason for you to upgrade. There's no reason to upgrade the program either because other than what Mike had mentioned on Capture One, getting that much better cloning tool, um, uh, the, the upgrades in terms of adjustments and things like that, for the most part, are really important to topside photographers, not for us, certainly not for underwater. There are things that all of these programs do remarkably well that we will never utilize in an underwater photograph. Okay, so for us, it's the things that we talked about, you know, it's, it's being able to control our, our highlights and our shadow areas, being able to do a color correction, being able, you know, the, the other thing that's important to us as underwater photographers is sometimes we will do a white balance and then have to go in and separately adjust a particular color. For instance, we could do a white balance on um, a blue water picture, like, like Mike's shark picture early on, and then find that the blue water got a little tiny bit funky. So we can go into a color correction, not having anything to do with white balance, and, and make our blues look different, make our blues look a little bit better. See, here we're making it look worse, here we're making it a little worse by going in the other direction, but we can make that adjustment, especially if, if, if we're in slightly green water, we might be able to get that blue water to, to appear in our image by making that color adjustment as, as well. Every single program out there does all of that stuff. We hit the roadblock when it comes to how we can get rid of backscatter. And, and right now, the two that, that work best for us as underwater photographers are Lightroom and, and this Capture One that I have discussed. 
And that thing about the backscatter, that's really our feelings for you guys, because our pictures, oh, well, they're always clean. <laughs> and and you, it's unbelievably hard how it was for us to create this, this presentation, because, I mean, we had to look for pictures that weren't good. And like I said, every single picture comes out of our camera perfect. As a matter of fact, even before they get in the camera, they're perfect. <laughs> Anyhow, we, we feel for you. We know we're all there. I, I brought this picture up um, for a specific reason, and I hope you can see it. Um, uh, this is as it came out of the camera, but does it need any adjustments? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It depends. Um, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is if I come up to this picture and I just make the blacks a little bit blacker, okay, um, you kind of only appreciate it when you see the picture. Uh, I don't know. Can you still see it? So um, you see. So sometimes it it helps if you can if you can get away all the rest of the distractions. Um, and one of the things that Lightroom can do for you as well is you can actually uh, do that with Lightroom. You can hit the tab key and all of the palettes go away, and you just can just have a black background around the picture so that you can focus in on the picture and see it. I, I, I just wanted to make that little point. Nothing popped into my head there. Question time. Yes. Hello? Hey, yes, one second. Let me get me turned back on here. All right, just a few more questions. Let's see. Let me find them. Ivan asked, uh, colors vary from monitor to monitor. How do we calibrate them for color? Uh, it depends on what you're calibrating them for. If you're calibrating them for output, well, let me save that for a minute. If, if, you're, if you're just looking at, um, at your pictures, and, and let's say you have a laptop and let's say you have a desktop. Um, I, I, and I don't mean to sound like I'm, I'm a salesperson, but if you have a Mac, chances are you don't have to worry about that. Um, but if you, if you think that there might be some discrepancy, you can buy these, uh, calibrators that actually attach to the front of your screen that comes with software and it comes with, um, um, things that read a specific point and you can calibrate your your screens based on that okay i think that might be a little bit over the top only because monitors nowadays are so well done that um that type of a variance might be not necessary to deal with on the other hand if if you're looking for calibration for output then you have to work in conjunction with whoever is going to be doing the output because uh, let's say I was going to send uh, an image away for it to be output to the wall size. And I'm actually making gestures, but they can't see us. <laughs> They're looking at the screen. Um, in that case, you've got to go to the person who's going to be doing the outputting and they will give what give you what's known as a profile for that particular um, uh, device that they're gonna output it to. And you can add those, uh, that profile into your program, and then you can adjust the picture for that output, okay, for that particular picture. And the nice thing about uh, the programs is that you can have a version of the picture for looking at it on the screen, and you can have a version of it for being output wall size for one machine, or you can have a version of it being output from another vendor on another machine. You can have as many versions of those, that picture that you, that you want. You don't have three different pictures though. You have three different recipes. So it's not like you're making copies of it. No, now, oh God, I got to keep track of all of these different pictures. No, the software does that. And it's not another picture. It's another recipe. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. What software do you recommend for video processing? Uh, if you're if you're on a Mac, it it's simple. Uh, iMovie comes with it, and iMovie works 
for 99% of the stuff that, that we've ever needed to do. Um, My, uh, Final Cut Pro is another option, if, again, if you're on a Mac. If you're not on a Mac, then Adobe has Premiere Pro. Um, um, GoPro, uh, uh, if you're using your GoPro, has, has their software. Um, it depends on what your, what your output is going to be, what, what you want it to be on the output. You know what I mean? Um, there's also, um, Adobe also has um, Premiere Elements, which is um, kind of like the iMovie version right. of, of Premiere Pro. Right. So um, it depends on your output. Can you explain how to, can you explain how to adjust, how the adjustment process in Adobe Photoshop Elements? You explain how to adjustment. Can you explain how to adjustment process in Adobe Photoshop Elements? It's it kind of the same as with Lightroom and Aperture and the other programs that we talked about. Providing you're you know you're dealing with uh, raw files. If you're dealing with JPEGs, it'll be limited. I think it's going to open up the Adobe Raw, um, the Adobe right, Raw right, program. Right. Right. Okay, so the common the common things that you're going to do are going to be done a little bit outside of of uh, your your photo program. It's going to be done in Adobe Raw. So you're gonna you're gonna be forced to make a lot of adjustments early on, and then uh, it's you have to hit a save, and and it'll go into into Photoshop Elements. But then it doesn't exist as a raw file anymore. Right. It it exists as uh, probably a, a PSD. Um, PSD a, a DNG of TIFF. Something, yeah. Something that. But it's not gonna it's not gonna be that raw file anymore, and it's and it's fairly clunky if you've taken a bunch of pictures. Here's the thing: is is most of the time we're taking dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures. To work in in uh, Photoshop Elements or even Photoshop, um, here's where your file structure needs to be really tight, because what's going to happen is those files are going to be making little sidecar. Uh, those programs are going to make little sidecar files that are going to sit right next to your image in in that folder. Again, so, basically, so basically the recipe that it makes is actually another file as opposed to the recipe that the program keeps in its own memory. So if you had a hundred photos in a folder and you made adjustments in Adobe Lightroom or Adobe uh, Photoshop Elements or Adobe Photoshop, the first thing that would happen is if it was a raw file, it would open up Adobe Raw, separate little program. And you'd have to make those raw adjustments. And then to export, you have to hit save. And when you hit save, it's taking um, one of those 100 files and it's creating a 101st file. Okay, and if you adjusted all of them, you would have 200 files. But 100 of those would be your original files and 100 would be your, your little tiny files. And you cannot separate the two from their storage place because if you do whenever you opened up that that original again you'd have to rework it so what happens is when we go to lightroom when we go to any of the programs that include a database we're essentially having the program keep track of all of that stuff for us whereas when we do it in lightroom we have to do it one at a time there's going to be no um, light table view in, where you're going to see in Photoshop or, uh, 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 yeah in Photoshop elements. Um, you're going to you almost have to use Adobe Bridge. So now you're talking about three programs. Number one, Adobe Bridge, which is nothing more than a sorting software. So you can look at a light table view. You double click on one of those images, it's gonna open up Adobe Raw, and then your final adjustments and spotting is gonna be in Adobe Photoshop Elements. For $9 a month, $10 a month, you go to Lightroom, 
and and it deals with all of that nonsense right. for you. Right. The the price is so ridiculously fair for what you get with Lightroom and Photoshop bundled together. Right. Um, it's 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 crazy not to use one of those programs. Um, the other thing, though, that it's important to remember is if you have a subscription to anything, uh, if you, especially if you have a subscription to Adobe products, before you go on a trip, before you get on a boat where there's going to be no internet connection, it's very important for you in the week before you go on a trip to open up all those programs and allow them to make a connection, an internet connection. Because if there's been no internet connection in the past 30 days, those programs will not allow you to work. Um, it's gonna look to make an internet connection. So, you know, if you're going on a two week trip, then maybe a couple days before you get on the airplane, make sure you open up Lightroom, make sure you open up Photoshop, that's in a subscription because somewhere towards the end of your trip, you may find that, oh, I was working on this picture yesterday and now the program has locked me out. Okay. Uh, let's see. Would you ever sharpen an image that you've already zoomed into? Ah, uh, okay. So when you say zoomed into, you're talking about cropped. Right. Um, depends you, on the cropping. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the crop. I mean, um, we've had, we have people who have, you know, a, an image that is one shark in the midst of a, of a giant scene and, and they're cropping out the shark's head. Here's a, here's a simple answer. Yes. Do it. Look at it. If it looks horrible, don't do it. The thing is, the more you crop, the more you're going to see some noise, regardless of, of, of and the doing any sharpening. Pixel, individual right. pixels, too. So it depends. If you've just cropped a little bit, it's no big deal. You'll right. be able to do it. Right. But if you've cropped, uh, you know, just a little tiny portion out of a big picture, chances are you're going you're gonna to see some. Understand, too, that sharpening, you can't make an out-of-focus picture sharp by sharpening it. That's not what sharpening does. Sharpening uh, kind of makes it a little more contrasty with between pixels, okay? But it, it can't make something that's out-of-focus in focus. Okay. Uh, someone here asked, when I use Lightroom, I have not seen the luminance histogram that allows the bottom sliders as you used in your demo pick. Am I missing it somewhere? Probably, yeah. yeah. I, I, no, no, no. Are you missing it? Yes, because you're using Lightroom. Uh, Aperture has it, Lightroom doesn't. You can actually do that with, um, uh, by just going along the line um, on, the, on the curve and dragging. Uh, if, if you look at that, at that point on Lightroom where that kind of a, it's a curve, okay, and there's a, a diagonal line going down it. If you just move your cursor along that line, you'll see that there's like little gray halos that will jump up in the line. There's like four of them or so, and you'll see points along the line if you click. You can you can do it that way. In in, in this particular case, you're dragging you're dragging a point on that line down or up, and so you're making that straight diagonal line kind of hooky or with a hump or or whatever at certain points, uh, either on the black side, the not so black side, the mid-tone side, the not so white side, and the white side, so. Okay, well guys. Capture One has it. Yeah. Capture One has it as well, so. Yeah. Okay. All right guys, well I think we should go ahead and wrap it up. Um, you guys wanna give a quick pitch for your 2020 charters that you have, Hope, hoping that everything is open up very soon? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, all the rest of the trips this year have been fantastic. I mean, uh, we were we were places that, uh, man, the diving was amazing. Okay, uh, wish you'd all had been there. But there's two uh, two more left. If you want to try and join us, we are going to have a ten day trip on the Bahamas Aggressor starting September 9th, and 
man, I love uh, the Southern Bahamas, um, that Exuma area. And um, yes, we will go see the piggies. <laughs> awesome. Love them piggies. Um, uh, and then um, in October, on October 10th, we will be on the Belize Aggressor 3 in one of our another favorite places um, uh, in Belize. So um, to make up for those trips that didn't quite get a chance to get off this year, uh, some of those people have jumped over, but we, have, we still have seats open. So if you want to come join us and you want to go diving, um, we'd love to have you on board. All right, and I've uh, just posted a link here in the chat box if you want to learn more about uh, the Jim Church School and the Mike and Mike uh, School of Photography here um, and their upcoming charters, you guys can at that link there. Um, all right, well, that's it, guys. Appreciate you guys being on. Thank you very much. Sorry for the little glitch earlier, but glad we were able to pull out of it. Oh, wait, hang on a minute. Did we stop? Oh, no, yeah, because you, you, you want to see us first. You don't want to yeah. see us wave and say goodbye and yay. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Bye now. Bye-bye.